Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Peake. Hello again, Edinburgh. Okay, fine. Now, this, the speech I'm going to do today and the talk I'm going to do today um, is a talk I've now done probably around about 300 times, but I've amended it and I've put different changes, I've put new uh, slides into this to actually reflect where I'm going with my latest research. Um, just to let you know, at the moment I'm uh, working on a book with Professor Irvin Laszlo, and many of you may know Laszlo. Uh, he's been nominated for the Nobel Prize three times, to my knowledge and also one of the world's leading noetic thinkers. And myself and Irvin are working together on a book to actually understand and see if there is evidence of consciousness existing outside of the brain. Um, I'm very excited about this project, and if anybody has had experiences of, of perceptions outside of the normal brain, in other words, perceiving things outside things you couldn't normally see, please do contact me on this. Uh, I'm active on Facebook. My cards are down there, so please, it's important I get feedback from people. Right, okay, without further ado, let's um, start. Right, we mentioned before near-death experience. Near-death experience is a phenomenally common occurrence. Um, some in the region of 20 to 30% of people who have cardiac arrest will report the fact that certain states of mind take place when we are in this liminal state between life and death. My approach to the phenomenon is quite different to most other researchers in the sense that I feel that it's become rather moribund in the sense that all that is happening now is that people are just thrashing the same donkey to death in the sense all they're doing is they're bringing forward people's experiences. Nobody's trying to explain it. What I try to do is put it together with neurology and uh, the latest research in quantum physics and consciousness studies. So where I'm going to be taking you today is probably not where you've been before in terms of near-death studies. Uh, particularly, for instance, the, the people that were speaking before, the only person there that's fairly close to me is Tom Campbell. And if anybody's interested, myself and Tom did a, a dual interview on Sweden's Red Ice Radio uh, two years ago. So that will give a, a feedback as to where Tom and I are on this. The movie The Matrix. You remember the circumstances where Thomas Anderson, who's a hacker, suddenly discovers the reality he thought was reality suddenly isn't. He suddenly finds that for his whole life he's been living in a computer simulation, a simulation of his life. During the, the time that this is explained to him by somebody called Morpheus, he's given the opportunity to either take a blue pill and go back into the illusory reality that we call consensual reality, or he's given the opportunity to take a red pill, and as the quote says, go down the rabbit hole. My work, I believe, is a rabbit hole, because effectively what I'm suggesting is, is this world that we exist within is some form of computer simulation, or a simulation engendered, engineered by your brain. Okay, one of the things that has long intrigued me in terms of how the human brain works is the phenomenon known as precognition. Now, I'll guarantee that the members of the audience here that have had precognitive dreams, precognitive events in your life, where you will know exactly what is going to happen in the future. Now, I was intrigued about this, and I wanted to see if there was ever any evidence of a precognition that was so profound, so powerful, and so irrefutable that it could not be denied. Because remember, most people, when they have precognitions, it's only after the event you'll turn around and say that, I knew this was going to happen. You know, that's not proof as far as the skeptics are concerned. You need something very, very powerful. I believe I found it. Here we have a picture of 9-11. Very, very famous piece of film. Well, it wasn't actually a famous piece of film. I remember seeing this film when the, um, the two, or two or three days after the 9-11 events, I saw a sequence of film on uh, the BBC, and it was a guy who originally I thought was um, having a cup of coffee, but what in fact he was doing when I did manage to find the film was he was leaning on his, um, his uh, truck and leaning back and filming his friend. And as he does so, the plane goes into the building up there like that, okay? This was, this was around the world, this image. Now, look at this. This is an album cover by a rap band called Coup. Now, 
as you can see, the guys have actually taken that image profoundly. They have got everything right. If you look at the way the smoke is coming out here, it's virtually identical. You know, it's almost identical. What is also interesting is the angle by which the, uh, the guy who designed the album cover, a guy called Bootsy Collins, has actually done the angle. What is intriguing about this is this album cover was designed in May of 2001. The authorities were so intrigued by this that Collins was actually called in by the authorities because they believed that he had some kind of inner information about the event. But clearly, there's something stranger going on here because he was asked about the events and he said he just thought it was an image he had in his mind that he thought was incredibly powerful. Now, of course, the, the skeptics will turn around and say, well, you know, it's an attack on capitalism. It's making a point the Twin Towers are a symbol of capitalism. That as it may be, why did he choose that particular angle? Why did he use that particular cloud pat uh, damage pattern? How is it he even got the damage to the right of both of the towers? If you look at here, the plane is actually hitting the left tower, and it's the smoke is carrying through to the other tower that's got the antennae on. It's exactly the same. That is too much of a chance, as far as I'm concerned. But this is not the only people who sensed something to do with 9-11. Here is uh, a, a drawing up here. There is a picture of the Twin Towers. This was done by a guy called David Mandel. And David Mandel had dreams which he saw future events, and he used to do paintings of them. Mandel had this dream on the night of September the 10th, 1996. On September the 11th, 1996, he actually went downstairs and he did this painting here. In order to date stamp his paintings, he goes to his local NatWest bank in Sudbury, in, uh, I think it's Sudbury on the Hill in North London. And what he does is he stands below the clock in the, in the, the bank, because you know that banks, they actually have the date and the time and everything else, so it's effectively date stamped. So there is no question that he did this in advance. But it gets more intriguing, because he then had another series of dreams, and he drew pictures of a plane hitting a building here, and he wrote underneath, plane hits buildings. On top of that, if you look in the corner here, you have the top of the um, Statue of Liberty. So he's clearly making out it's New York. So here we have another resonant image of 9-11 before it took place. Mandel also had another dream. And he dreamt he saw Concorde with its tail on fire, about to crash. He knew that it was going to take place somewhere in France. He has a French flag down here. What happened? Concorde takes off and actually has the back of the tail on fire and crashes. Yet again, we have somebody here who's actually seeing the future, quite, quite precise. Now, I also have a friend of mine who saw Concorde crashing about six months before it took place. I have in my records a date-stamped fax that this friend of mine sent to British Airways, warning them that Concorde was going to crash, and he knew it was somewhere in a foreign country. Of course, British Airways didn't react to it in any shape or form, but nevertheless, we have these resonances through time. But the intriguing thing about all these images are, is that they're actually taken from not the scenes themselves, but seeing them on television. In other words, the images we just saw now were not the images of somebody who was actually seeing the event. They were images of somebody seeing the event on television or photographs in the media. Now, to me, this is of significance. And the reason it's of significance is because it points back to the work of a guy called John William Dunn. And John William Dunn was, subsequently became an aeronautical engineer, but in 1902, he was, um, I think he was working for the Daily Telegraph, and he was down covering the aftermath of the Boer War. And one particular night, he had this incredibly vivid dream, and he was living on a French-speaking Caribbean island. And in the dream, the French-speaking inhabitants were telling him that there'd been a terrible disaster 
on the other side of the island where the main town had been destroyed and 4,000 people had been killed. This dream was so powerful that Don sensed there was something significant about it. And he waited for the newspaper reports to come through from, uh, from London, which, of course, in those days would take two or three days, if not more, to get down to him. When he received the newspaper report, this was what it said. There had been a volcanic explosion. Mount Pelé, which is the, the mountain on the French Caribbean island of Martinique, had exploded. And a glowing cloud of, of acrid, poisonous dust had, flown down, had, had gone down the, the hillside into the main town of Saint-Pierre. Everybody in the town was killed, with the exception of one man. And this is an irony of life. The one man who survived was a guy who had been condemned to death and was actually in a cell. And because the cell was below ground, when the poisonous crowd rolled across the town, he was below ground level and he survived. So even people in the ships in the bay were also killed. He was such so amazed by this that he thought, I've, it's the newspaper report that I've remembered, not the event. My dream was me making a dream up from the newspaper event. So rather like myself, he writes a book on his experiences and he called it an experiment with time. And what he suggested you do is that we, mo he argued that we regularly precognitively dream. And he suggested you have a little dream diary which you keep by your bedside and you make notes of the dreams you have. Because what will happen is your dreams will be mixed up, your precognitions will be mixed up with other things. But the precognitions will be in there and it's only a matter of interpreting them. And in the, 1920, in the 1930s, I think he wrote the book about 1928, in the 1930s, this book was profoundly popular. He's doing a talk one day, and he turns around and he, he makes this speech about the 4,000 people that have been killed. And somebody stands up in the audience and said, you're wrong, you know. You always say that 4,000 people were killed. 40,000 people were killed that day. And he went back to the newspaper report, and he found that he'd misread it. Because if you look here, it says 40,000. And this to him was proof that what actually happens is that we embroider dreams depending upon when we, in our own future, perceive them. Now, this intrigued me because I thought, well, what does this tell us about life? How can we see the future before it's happened? And I started to collect cases of precognitions that seem to mix in with something even more peculiar. This is a Pant Glass School in South Wales. Now, it was only subsequently I discovered that this actual photograph I'd used in this presentation had actually been taken almost the same month and the same year as the, the, uh, the disaster on uh, Sampia on Martinique. And it's just a picture of the village school. An attendee at that village school in 1965, I think it was, was a little girl called Errol May Jones. And one morning, Errol May Jones wakes up and says to her mother, Mummy, I don't want to go to school. I'm going to die. I'm going to be black. I've dreamt I'm going to be in blackness. All my school friends are going to be black. It's going to be dark and it's going to be horrible. I don't want to die, Mummy. Don't let me go to school. Errol May's mother said, you're eight years old. You're not going to die. Will you please go to school? So she does so, and nothing happens. The next day, she goes to school, and that happened. Of course, Panglass School was the school of Abavan. Little Errol May Jones and I think 114 other people that day died. And you may recall what happened was the, um, the coal tip at the back of this old mining town, there'd been lots of rain and it became viscous. And it rolled through the town, demolishing a load of houses and ploughing into the school, killing the school children and the teachers inside. Now, something had created a done dream in the mind of a little eight-year-old child. That done dream was trying to make the child not go to school. In other words, the done dream contained a message warning the person dreaming to not do something. Now, if Errol May had not gone to school, she would have been saved. The dream would not have been precognitive because she would have saved herself, which suggests alternate futures, depending upon which track you follow and which decisions you make. I then wanted to find more information from this, and I came across this fascinatingly intriguing case. In, 19, in the late 1950s, 
German company developed something they called Distaval. Distaval was um, a, a drug that was used to actually calm people down. You know, if you, you were hyperactive or whatever, it could actually calm you down. It was considered to be so safe that pregnant women could take it, young children could take it. In 1961, or possibly 1962, a lady goes to her doctor and she says, my son is hyperactive. I need something to calm him down. So the doctor said, well, you're in luck because we have this little drug called Distaval. It can be taken by young children. It will calm him down. So she takes the drug home, gives it to her son, and lo and behold, within a couple of doses, he's fine. She doesn't use the full amount, so she puts it in her bathroom cabinet and she forgets about it. Around about six months later, in my second book, The Damon, I did a lot more research on this case. I cite it in my first book, but in the second book, I did a lot more research on the background on it. Later on, she goes, she's, she's lying in bed about four or five months later, and she can't sleep. Her mind is hyperactive. And then she remembers that she's got Distaval in the bathroom cabinet. So she goes to the bathroom cabinet, takes the Distaval out, takes out a glass of water, and she's about to drink it. As she does so, a voice in her head distinctly says, do not drink this, this is not for you, you are pregnant. Now, she had no idea whether she was pregnant or not, but she went to the doctors and the doctor confirmed that she was indeed pregnant. Now, it's not at all surprising that probably subliminally, and probably the ladies in the audience who have had children will probably know this, that you're probably subliminally aware of the fact that there are chemical changes in your body in the early parts of pregnancy. So there are subtle clues that you might subliminally pick up. However, what was strange about this story was she actually carried through the pregnancy and she had a son who became a very, very talented artist. Meanwhile, in Australia, a guy, a guy called McBride, a doctor called McBride, noticed something rather strange. He noticed that he had had two or three cases in the previous four or five years of something called focalia which is children who were born with, the, with their, their hands or their feet actually attached to either their shoulders or their, their hips, or their, their limbs are foreshortened in some way. He then contacted various other doctors Aust across Australia, and he discovered a pattern. So he immediately contacted the manufacturers of Distaval in the UK, who were distillers, and turned around to them and said, there's something wrong, we think, with the drug, because we've tested this out, and it seems that all the women had taken Distaval during their pregnancy. They get hold of the German company and immediately they pull the drug because, of course, as you probably know, the drug was also known as thalidomide. Now, the interesting thing about thalidomide was that it was only damaging to a pregnant woman if it was taken, I think, in the, the second and third week of pregnancy. Otherwise, it was fine. That's why nobody had really spotted it because if it had been the whole pregnancy cycle, there would have been a lot more cases but there weren't. Now, take this through. Her son became an artist. If he had been born without arms, it would have been profoundly difficult for him to fulfill his ambitions. Something in the mother in question knew an alternate future that was about to happen. So in this case, the voice in the head actually changed the future for the positive. So here we have again an example of a voice in the head now, I was intrigued by this when I was researching my first book because I thought, can this be linked in some way to precognition because the voice is clearly precognitive? What does this mean? And then I started researching on near-death experience and some of the things about near-death experience intrigued me and one of the particular areas of near-death experience that intrigued me was something called a panoramic life review. It's one of the moody traits. that There is a series of traits that are actually doctors use to, to analyze a near-death experience. You know, the going towards the light, the floating out of the body, etc. But the, 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 the panoramic life review is one of the, the, the major typologies. I thought to myself, if I have a, f if in the final moments of my life, my life flashes before my eyes, that suggests that my life has been recorded, doesn't it? How else can that happen? I know that I can't remember my own childhood. I have flashes of my childhood. We have flashy, flash memories. They're actually called charged memories that we have of our childhood. And again, it's odd, isn't it? If you look back to your childhood, the things you remember in your childhood are not necessarily the time you were told when your grandmother died. 
It would be something tactile, like remember, remembering touching a piece of fur or, or a particular stormy day or being in your pram. It's as if certain memories, are, are, as if it's a recording and certain parts of the recording mechanism are super saturated to make that memory more powerful. But if it is the case that our brain records our whole life, can it be proven? Can it be shown? I believe it can. This is a guy called Wilder Penfield. And Wilder Penfield was a, an, a Canadian neurosurgeon. And Penfield's younger sister had died through complications due to inoperable epilepsy. And what Penfield wanted to do was to find a way of operating and knowing which parts of the brain had the problems with epilepsy. Because you probably know epilepsy is a storm in the brain. So it starts in one point of the brain called a focus. And it spreads out like a forest fire across the brain. If it crosses the corpus callosum, which is the thing that joins the two hemispheres of the brain into the, the other hemisphere, you black out. You have a grand mal seizure. But he realized that if you can stop the storm starting, you can actually localize it. And what he did was, he thought, well, there's a mechanism why you could do this. If you can find where it starts in the brain, you can actually cut round the, the brain matter around where it starts, rather like um, firemen, if there's a forest fire. They will cut a trench with water or sand in it to localize the fire. He thought, if you can find the part of the brain where the, the temple, where the seizure starts, you can isolate it. The problem was, this is pretty radical surgery, so you needed to know what parts of the brain did what, because you couldn't start cutting bits out of somebody's brain willy-nilly, because you could damage them. So what he did was, he did a series of operations, whereby he, he, he took a part of the skull out of a patient. Now, you may or may not be aware, but the skull feels pain, but the brain doesn't. So effectively, you can give local anesthetic to the skull and the scalp, and you can cut out a part of the skull, and then you can manipulate the brain of a conscious patient. And the reason this is effective is, it means if you have an electrode, you can place it on exposed areas of the brain, and you can ask the person what they're experiencing. Okay? And what his plan was, that he would map the brain. And what he did was he worked his way systematically through the brain. Now, this is one of his examples taken from one of his books. And as you can see, when the, exposed, when the brain was exposed, they put numbers on the sections of the brain, and then they, they asked the person what that evoked in them. They worked their way around the brain and the various parts of the brain till they got to the temporal lobes, which are the areas around the ear. When they got to the temporal lobes and he placed the electrode onto the exposed temporal lobes of these patients, many of them immediately had past life memories. Some of them had three-dimensional past life memories where they were literally back in a time in their past. On one occasion, he placed the electrode on an exposed brain of a woman, and she was back in her kitchen, in her house, 20-odd years before. And she said she was actually there. She could hear the conversation of her next-door neighbors across the fence. She then hears her son call. So what Penfield did was he, he distracted her. He took the electrode off, and she said, oh, dear, what did you do? It stopped. So he distracted her and asked her about her son and what her son was doing. While she was distracted, he placed the electrode back on the same point of the brain, and she turned around and said, what have you just done? I'm back there again, back in her kitchen. Penfield reproduced this many, many times in his career, and he became convinced that the human brain remembers everything. It's encoded within the brain, probably using something like holography. Because one of the major issues you'll find, if you look in brain science, you'll find that the one major problem has been the location of the engram, the location of where memory is in the brain. Uh, a guy called Paul Carl Lashley spent most of his career trying to find the location of memories in the brain. The reason they've not been able to find memories in the brain is because another guy called Carl Pribram uh, of Georgetown University came along and suggested that memories work holographically. And as you know, a hologram has all the information across the whole field. So therefore, the, the, the brain's memories work holographically either within the brain or somewhere else. So that's why you'll never find memories. But it does seem that memories have some kind of location within the temporal lobes. And they think the reason, behind, the reason for this is behind the temporal lobes uh, are, are, are smaller areas of the brain that have associations with emotion. And they think this is how it works. 
So we had one person under peculiar circumstances who could actually remember the past. But there is one guy um, called Solomon Sharonevsky who remembered everything in his life. In fact, he had been um, a memory man in Russia in the 1920s, and he's earned, he earned his living by going around Russia doing shows with memories. The problem was he couldn't, he couldn't get rid of the memories. The memories were there all the time. Now imagine how difficult that would be, that you remember every single thing of your life. Your brain is full of all this nonsense, so you can't really function. So one day, Sharonevsky turned up at the doorstep of this guy here, Alexandra Luria, who was a top psychiatrist in Moscow, and he said, can you do something about my memory, please? It's driving me crazy. Sharonevsky couldn't do anything, but he studied this guy for a few years, and he wrote an amazing book, which I suggest you read, called Mind of a Memnonic, Memnonist. And it's about Sharonevsky's phenomenal memory. But one of the things that Sharonevsky said to Luria intrigued me. He turned round and he said, I think the reason I remember everything is because of my illness. He never really discusses his illness in great detail, but I checked up on this. His illness was epilepsy. His illness was epilepsy located or focused on his temporal lobes. So clearly here we have a link with memory and temporal lobe epilepsy, epilepsy focused in the temporal lobes. Does anybody know the work of my vague namesake, Kim Peek, the, the Rain Man, the guy that Rain Man was based upon, who lived in Salt Lake City? He died about three or four years ago. The guy that um, Tom Cruise and the guy, the guy that was in the film took him off. This guy had such a memory, Kim Peek forgot nothing. Not only that, when he was bored, and he visited a town, he used to get hold of the telephone directories and add up all the numbers. He'd go down the list and add them all up, and he was always right. He could read three books at the same time. He could mirror read. He could read two books, and he could mirror read. He couldn't tie his own shoelaces. He, again, had temporal lobe epilepsy. So clearly, there is something with this temporal lobe epilepsy, and I wanted to know more about it. I am going somewhere with this, by the way, in case you're wondering, and it is linked to near-death experience. This is a picture painted by a temporal lobe epileptic, uh, part of a scheme by a guy called Dr. Stephen Schachter in New York. What is this epileptic trying to get across here? They feel there's somebody else in their head. They're trying to get the picture, an idea of duality. And I started to think when I was looking at near-death experience, I was thinking, hold on a minute, there's a link here. Temporal lobe epileptics think there's a feeling of duality. They also seem to feel that they know the future. And the reason they know this is, and if anybody knows or experiences temporal lobe epilepsy in the audience, you'll know precisely what I'm going to say now. Before you have a pre, before you have a seizure, if indeed you do have a full seizure, you'll have something called the aura. And the aura, one of the main themes of a temporal lobe epilepsy aura, is deja vu sensations, profound deja vu sensations. It's as if you know what's going to happen next. I'm a classical migrainer, and I get this to a lesser extent sometimes. So it's clearly linked neurologically. It's as if you can see the future. You know you've lived this time before. So I started looking into TLE. And I found some fascinating things about people throughout history. Great writers. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of people throughout history that supposedly had temporal lobe epilepsy. Many of them claimed that they were two people. I'll give some examples. I'm aware of time here, but I'll give one or two examples here. This is Fyodor Dostoevsky, Russian writer. If any of you have read any Fyodor Dostoevsky, the one thing you'll find is he has two preoccupations. One preoccupation he had is doubles or doppelgangers. Book after book, he discusses doppelgangers. He's also preoccupied with another phenomenon, time slowing down. He's also preoccupied with, with the mysteries of life. These are all things that temporal lobe epileptics have. There's something called Gershwin syndrome that they have, where they see links, they're hyper-religious. They're very, very deep. A lot of religious leaders throughout history have been diagnosed as having temporal lobe epilepsy. And this is because of the way they see the world. I'm now in contact with literally dozens and dozens of temporal lobe epileptics from around the world. They all reinforce this. They usually contact me because they'll say, you're the first person that's ever written about how I feel about my illness. 
and all of them feel there's somebody else in their mind. Um, the guys down the bottom here uh, are Emile and Jules Goncourt, the French realist, paint, realist writers. Emile Goncourt was asked about life, and he said, life is a nothing between two epileptic seizures. Now, bear that in mind as we move on, because that was a profoundly important statement. So clearly there must be something linked here with the brain, something linked with the way the brain functions. Those of you who attended my last lecture will probably can go to sleep now, in case if you haven't already. But it's the structures of the brain I'm now intrigued in. What is this telling us about the structures of the brain? And I believe there's something intriguing happening here. As you probably know, your brain is full of neurons, brain cells. You have billions of brain cells in your brain. None of the brain cells touch. They have what's called a synaptic gap. And the synaptic gap, which is this thing here, depending upon what signal is going across the brain, depends on what chemical is released. Now, the interesting thing about certain times during our life, there's a particular neurochemical that is known to be released in times of stress and, and death. It's called glutamate. And glutamate is the major neurotransmitter chemical of the mammalian brain. It functions and it helps memory, it helps a lot of things, and it's particularly focused on the temporal lobes. But the one thing about glutamate, if there's too much of it, it causes excitotoxicity. It actually kills brain cells. So when you're in great times of stress and the glutamate is released, there are other drugs released in your brain to actually cut down the glutamate. This is what happens when you have a shock or you're involved in a car crash or an accident. I'm sure that members of the audience here have had the experience of time slowing down when you've had an accident, you've been in a car crash. That's the glutamate or the effects of the glutamate in the brain. What is a known fact is that glutamate floods the brain at the point of death. Now bear that in mind as well. So we have these neurotransmitters within the brain and within the neurotransmitter, within the, 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 the structures of the brain and within the neurons of the brain are other very, very small structures called microtubules. And there are literally billions of microtubules in every single neuron. So therefore, there are trillions of microtubules in your brain, the little kind of structures of protein. Now, what is intriguing about these structures of protein, it's work being done by Professor Roger Penrose and Dr. Stuart Hammerhoff. Stuart Hammerhoff is an anesthesiologist at the University of Arizona. Again, as I always say to my, pe my people when they come to my talks, don't take my word for this, check this out. You know, just check it out to see if, whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Hammerhoff is an anesthesiologist. He is fascinated as to how anesthetics work. Because whatever doctors tell you, they haven't got a clue how anesthetics work. They know which anesthetics work, but they don't know why. They don't know why an anesthetic, when you take it, makes your consciousness completely disappear and then come back again. They have no idea why that happens. Hammerhoff is interested in this, and he believes it's to do with the microtubules. Professor Roger Penrose is the, is the, the Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge, and he's also a theoretical physicist. These guys both argue that there's something peculiar happening within the microtubules of the brain. The microtubules of the brain are intriguing because they give off pulses of light, pulses of electromagnetic radiation. These pulses go from either side of the microtubule, and the waves of the light interfere with each other. They call, cause interference patterns. Now, if there's any group of people in the audience that know about holograms, that's what holograms are. They're interference patterns. Now, let's think about this. If your brain contains trillions and trillions of these tiny little things, they're all, called, all generating tiny little, micro, uh, tiny little holograms. Is that where memory comes from? In fact, is this what this is? Your brain is generating this reality from the holograms being drawn up within your brain. Of course, the question is, where's this information coming from? Where do these, where do these bio photons come from? And they believe the latest theories are suggesting that the bio photons are related to mini black holes. Uh, Stephen Hawking, has postulated that the universe is full of tiny, tiny black holes. As you know, a black hole is an area of gravitation where it's so dense in its mass that even light can't escape. If these are everywhere, it means they're in your brain. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them in your brain now, at this moment. If that is the case then, 
they create what's called wormholes. And wormholes are, are literally breaks in space where information can come from one part of the universe to another. Again, I can't go into detail on this, but effectively the technical term for these is Einstein-Rosen bridges. So, the information then in turn is drawn up from something called the Bose-Einstein condensates. And Bose-Einstein condensates are very, very peculiar plasma-like structures in which subatomic particles act like a single particle. Because, again, I can't go into detail here, I do another talk on this about how quantum physics works, how it really functions, rather than how the New Age people would like it to believe. But the actual fact of the matter is, is that subatomic particles, there's a point where behaviour of subatomic particles stops being weird and becomes normal. Okay? But Bose-Einstein condensates, because there are a group of particles all acting as one particle, Bose-Einstein condensates can actually have an effect in the Newtonian universe, the universe we exist within. Bose-Einstein condensates, I argue, are actually functioning within the microtubules of the brain, which means subatomic behaviours can actually be drawn up. And the subatomic behaviours and the information it is sits in something called zero-point energy. It was touched upon earlier on today. Zero-point energy is supposedly, um, from the research that's been done, and there's very, very strong evidence that, it, that this stuff actually exists, is, is a whole field of information that actually fills the vacuum of space. It's also called vacuum energy. And it's everywhere. It fills everywhere. Space is not a vacuum. It's the complete opposite. It's a plenum. Now, if anybody's interested on this, uh, in August I will be doing a web webinar with Professor Irvin Laszlo and Professor D um, Bernard Haish. And Bernard Haish is an astrophysicist who has a grant from the American government to be researching zero-point energy as a, as, a, as a source of energy, okay? So this is the real deal, this stuff. Bose-Einstein, zero-point energy is an energy field. And being a field, it can process information. It contains information. Irvin Laszlo has suggested not only does it contain information, it contains all information. That's where everything is contained, and it's all digitized within the zero-point field. Laszlo calls it something else. He calls it the Akashic field. Has anybody heard of the Akashic record and the idea of somewhere that actually contains everything? There is an idea at the basic level of reality. There is something that contains everything. This is the computer program by which reality runs. Okay? So, what I'm actually saying here is that this is a loop of how I think all this works. And it, we go down to microtubules, bosite, and bring up from zero-point energy. But this is then uploaded into the brain, which generates the external world as a, a, some form of illusion. And then we come down here to the out-of-body experience, which a lot of us have experienced in times, and the near-death experience. And I'll show you how this works now. This is the cheating the ferryman hypothesis. There's that picture again, by the way. Alex Gray. How this process works, I think at the point of death something very strange happens in the brain. And I use this analogy. Here's a skydiver. And the thing about this skydiver is he's done something very stupid. He's forgotten his parachute. So there's going to be a point where he's about to hit the ground, isn't he? At that point, the glutamate flood hits. Or what I'm now suggesting is more complex than that because I think the glutamate flood generates something called dimethyltryptamine in the brain. Dimethyltryptamine, we were talking some earlier, we were talking about ayahuasca. And of course, the main constituent of ayahuasca is dimethyltryptamine. Most powerful hallucinogenic drug known to man. It's known to be in the brain, it's known to be in the blood, it's known to be in virtually everything. And people will turn around and say, there's no evidence that DMT is in the brain. And I say to people, look up the research on something called the TARS receptors, which was about five or six years ago. I won't go into detail about that, but they're called the TAARS, the trace amines. We know that DMT is in the brain. DMT is released, and the strange thing that what happens with DMT, and people who've taken it will tell you this, time slows down. Suddenly, time, a split second, can be hours, years, a lifetime. On top of that, you start getting memories of your past life generated, drawn up from the zero point field. If that's the case, he's never going to hit the ground, is he? Because his time is not your time anymore. You can see him crash into the ground in your time, but in his time, he survives. And what does he do when he survives? 
He actually has his whole, whole life projected. He lives his life again effectively in a three-dimensional recreation of his life. He's in a computer game. He's in a computer simulation. And at that point of time, he splits into two. He splits into something I call the Edelon, which is what most of us are in the room, which are, which are creatures living your life in a linear fashion from your birth to your death in linear time, drawing up information from the zero point field. Whereas the daemon, who's the other part, suddenly is your universal self. It's your self that remembers your past lives. It's your self that knows you're living your life again. That is the voice in the head. That's the thing that warns you. That's your higher spirit. If some of you are mediums in the room, it's your spirit guide. This is what is happening. You are your own guide. And it works like a computer game. The zero point field is like a CD-ROM that has every single outlook, outcome of every single decision you can make in your life encoded in it. Which means, if you know what you're doing, you can live any potential life you could possibly live, which is your life. Lara Croft on the screen when you're playing Blade Runner, uh, playing Blade Runner, playing uh, Tomb Raider, as far as she is concerned, she only has one life. She runs down a corridor, she gets eaten by the monster. As far as the game player is concerned, she has dozens of lives, as many lives as he wants, because he knows what's going to happen and he can avoid the accident she had last time. This is what happened, or what Errol May Jones' Damon tried to do and failed in this universe, but in another universe would have succeeded. And this, of course, is the idea of the movie Groundhog Day. And in case if anybody's interested, I interviewed the guy who wrote Groundhog Day, Danny Rubin, a few weeks ago on one of my radio stations. And it's stopped there on the web if you want to hear it. By the way, Danny is... My first book is The Life After Death. Danny has given to all his associates at Harvard because he said, this guy's done the science of the movie Groundhog Day. My overall hypothesis has now been developed over a series of years. And as you can see here, the first book now has been published in various foreign languages as well. So it's starting to get out there into the real world. The three books on the, the four books on the side of the books I've already written and the two books, The Infinite Minefield, will be taking my ideas forward into the future with my new ideas. And I've also written an autobi a bi autobiography, a biography of Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer, applying my hypothesis to his life with his daemon and everything else. Let's go back to the model here. Now, what I'm trying to explain here is how the feedback works and the feedback loop. So we have an effective feedback loop, and I'll try and explain what I mean by this here is that you have the human brain with consciousness inside it. Whatever you are, you're inside your, you know, whether you're inside your brain or outside your brain is a moot point. But there is something inside your brain or there is something that is manifest within your brain from somewhere else, which you call me or I. And that's the being that you are throughout your life, okay? Now, one of the major problems of modern neurology and modern science is something called the hard problem. And the hard problem was put forward by an Australian uh, philosopher called David Chalmers. And what Chalmers is saying is that how can effectively inanimate matter with electrical stimuli and electrical signals going through it create the concept of a self-referential human being? Because every single person in this room, you have hopes, you have dreams, you have memories, you have anticipations. That is impossible within known science. You can take the brain apart piece by piece, but you will not find consciousness. You will find evidence of consciousness with an MRI scan and other things, but you will not find the location of consciousness or how consciousness is generated by the brain. So that's the hard problem. Modern science isn't even close to explaining that. So we have to think of something more revolutionary to explain exactly what it is that's taking place either within the brain or how the brain is working as a receiver. Okay, so we'll go through the feedback loop as I see it. So what we have here is you have your brain and there's the ex supposed external world. That is the external world of phenomenon that is outside that is presented to you through your senses. In other words, you're now looking at me, you are seeing me, you are seeing everything through electromagnetic radiation, through vibrations in your ears, which are actually being converted into electrical, sim uh, electrical impulses, which go through your brain, and somehow, magically, you create internally this external world. Now, remember two or three things I'd like to point out. You're now seeing me and everything in this room. 
That is being created from a little inverted image the size of a postage stamp on your retina. It's upside down and it's warped. Yet your brain can take that information and turn it into the three-dimensional surround visual world that you perceive. That is a magic trick beyond phenomenon. It is unbelievable how it does that. It's also unbelievable how you have a feeling of simultaneity with everything. The sounds are coming in at a different speed to your, to, to your eyesight. The positions of your body is working in a different way. Again, if you ever want to get neurologists panic-stricken, mention something called the binding problem, how it all comes together in the brain. But somehow, there is something processing the external world within your head. What they believe is processing it is all these little cells in your brain called neurons. Okay? And as I pointed out before, the neurons inside them have these structures called microtubules. As I mentioned, each, mi each microtubule is, is firing out things called biophotons, bits of electromagnetic energy. Now, this is internal light, and this is the, what I'll be dealing with in my next book. If you close your eyes now, or when you're at home and you're in the dark, and you press the corner of your eyes, you'll actually see light. And people will turn around and say, well, you're seeing light because it's pressing upon the nerves in the eye. Yeah, that's pressing on the nerves of the eye. It's not creating photons. So there must be an internal light that your brain can generate. That internal light, they've actually discovered now, they're called biophotons. Biophotons are little, form, little bits of energy that literally come up from DNA. DNA itself creates light. Is that the light you see when you dream? Because, of course, the great mystery is, when you dream, you have a visual experience. Blind people, when they have near-death experiences, see again. Sometimes, even when they've not ever seen anything, they see the world. So there's this inner light. Where does this inner light come from? I suggest that it's actually coming up from the microtubules in your brain. So the microtubules, as I say, create very, very tiny holograms. Now, holograms are very, very peculiar things. I don't know if you know, but if you take a holographic image and you, you take it apart, you break it apart, what you would naturally expect would be, it would be like a jigsaw. You know, you have a jigsaw and you take it apart, so each part of the picture just is one component of the picture. This is not how holograms work. If you take a hologram apart, each bit of the picture contains the whole. That's why, the, you know, that's the concept of a hologram. So in other words, every bit contains everything. And they believe the brain works on holographic principles as well, which is why memory can work so effectively. You only need one little bit of the information to have all the information. So what we do is we then go into the microtubules, and then you, with the microtubules, we have these little bits of light. And when you take light waves and you put them together, as I said, you get what's called an interference pattern, like all waves. Waves in water, for instance. If you drop two stones in water and the waves come out, as the waves join together, they, they interfere with each other. And what they do is they either will add power to the wave, depending on how they coincide, or they will have no wave at all. And that is, that's something that happens in subatomic physics as well with subatomic particles. In fact, going back a step, you may or may not be interested to know that there's a guy called Anton Zeilinger at the University of Vienna. And Zeilinger has found that molecules, large molecules, depending upon whether they are observed or measured or not, change from being a wave, a potential for being in existence, to a point particle. Now, this is fascinating, which means the reality we perceive here effectively is a potential statistical wave function until it's observed. It's called collapsing the wave function. And again, I always say to people, go out and look this up on the web. This is, this is hard science. You'll read this in New Scientist. You'll read it in Scientific American. So here we have a distinct relationship between mind and the external world. Mind creates matter. There is a relationship between the two. And this is where I think it happens within the microtubules. 
I was talking about Bose-Einstein condensates, and I think this will now make a little bit more sense if I'm telling you about this wave-particle duality. Subatomic particles behave not like the big world. We live in a world where there's causality. We live in a world where cause and effect follow each other. In the subatomic world, that's not the case. In the subatomic world, particles can be in two places at the same time. Particles can actually be found in places they shouldn't be. You can take two subatomic particles and what's called entangle them, then send those two particles off millions of miles apart, and if you do one thing to one particle, the other one reacts instantaneously. In fact, this is such a known phenomenon now that they're thinking of developing quantum computing based upon this hypothesis, and they're having a good deal of success. This means that the particles we see and the particles that create the reality we see are made up of effectively nothing. So people talk about the world being made of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. Atoms are 99.999% empty space. And what there is there is made up of quarks and other things that are also flitting in and out of reality. This is the real reality that we perceive. It is the mind that creates this. Without mind, there isn't matter. And again, people, it's going back to the deep philosophical ideas. But effectively, this is where science is going. And this is why science is in such a crisis at the moment. They really don't know how to interpret this information. So it's not generally put out in the general public. It's not hidden, but it's not generally put out there. So we then have the Bose-Einstein condensate. And what a Bose, as I explained, a Bose-Einstein condensate are these little bits of something that come in and out of, of, of actuality, come in and out of the quantum field. Because they work together, they can actually affect big things like us. Okay, so these strange things that we don't understand fully can affect how we think. We have the mini black holes and the Einstein Rosen bridges. These then draw down to something called the zero point field. And I think I rushed over a little bit what the zero point field is. Space is empty. Okay? We know this, we call it a vacuum. There, there are cosmic rays in there and everything else, but effectively it's a vacuum. However, they have found that you can place, you, you, can, you can actually place things inside a vacuum where there is nothing. And you put two metal plates together with, inside a vacuum, and they will start getting attracted together. They'll stick together. It's called the Casimir effect. That is impossible within our known science. And the way they have come to this conclusion is that there, are, there is a form of energy that exists at absolute zero, 273.15 degrees Kelvin, which is so cold that there is no energy. In other words, that's the definition of um, absolute zero. It's where energy stops. There is no energy. And yet they're finding that there is energy coming up from somewhere. In fact, there's something I think called helium-3, and it remains liquid even at absolute zero, or just above absolute zero, which effectively means that energy is coming from somewhere. And they believe this energy is the energy given off by subatomic particles themselves, and they call it zero-point energy. Just as a bit of information, the word zero-point is nothing to do with absolute zero. I can't go into detail now, but it's to do with the swing of a pendulum. When a pendulum swings, there's a point where it is straight down and there is no energy, and that's called the zero point of the pendulum. So this zero point energy, they believe, fills everything. And they also believe that zero point energy is a way, a new form of energy that can really help humanity. We were talking before about uh, the way in which we need energy. And zero point energy is one of these really sensitive areas. But Bernard Haish, an associate of mine, as I say, is one of the world's leading experts on zero-point energy. And again, if you get the opportunity, read Bernard Haish's book, The God Theory. Bernard Haish, again, he is a, an astrophysicist, so a highly qualified man. And his, his philosophies on these ideas are really quite fascinating. But it seems that the zero-point field has an ability to contain information in the same way that a CD-ROM or a DVD contains information. It seems to contain information digitally. 
It has information coded in it. And what I'm suggesting is, is that the zero point field is the equivalent of a DVD of a computer game. You know when you play a computer game, let's just go forward on this. When you play Tomb Raider, because I'm too old to remember the modern, too old to know the modern computer games. When you play Tomb Raider, you load the machine, and you have this little sprite on the screen, Lara Croft, and you find yourself in a cave somewhere. You then have Laura move down the cave until she meets a monster or something. And the monster comes out and it kills her. As far as she's concerned, she's dead. You can go back as the game player, back to the start of the game again, can't you? And then you play the game again. But this time, you know that the monster's going to come out. So what you do is you make sure that Laura doesn't go down that passage and goes down another passageway. And when you make that decision, effectively, you've made her survive for a little bit longer. So what happens is that the argument could be that your life is like this. That within the zero point field, all the information about your life and every single outcome of every decision of your life is already encoded on there. As is everybody else's outcome of every decision they make and every decision of every other human being on the planet. And every other entity and every other sentient entity. Which means we are living effectively in a three-dimensional three computer game. Now, as an aside, a couple of days ago, I'm, I'm dealing with an American researcher on this. Any of you guys know Second Life? Okay. On Second Life, it's a simulated world that you can have an avatar and you can live a second life on there. He was actually showing me programs he can run where there are computer screens on Second Life running Second Life. And on that Second Life computer screen, there's another computer screen running Second Life. So all we have is this depth of information and everything else. So imagine the scenario, you are playing the computer game, as we can see here, and the daemon and the Eidolon, the daemon is the part of you that has lived your life before, so it knows. So you remember, going back to my idea before, you're at the point of death, you're living your life again. You're, a de you're an Eidolon, you live your life as you would normally do, but there's part of you that knows. So one day, as, as people have said to me that have written for me around the world, they're driving in a car one day, and suddenly a voice in the head turns around and says, turn in now, turn in now. And one guy this happened to, he was actually driving on the road near Chester, and he said a voice in his head said, turn in now, so he turned in as a lorry came in the other direction. Would have been a head-on collision. I have example after example after example of times like that. That is the daemon, the game player, warning the on-screen, you, that there's going to be a danger up ahead because it remembered last time what happened. And this time round, it can help you avoid it. So what you need to do is listen to your daemon and listen to what it tells you. You know that inkling you get sometimes that something feels wrong or something feels right? Or sometimes you meet somebody and you recognize them straight away. That's your daemon giving you messages. This is why people have precognitions. They have precognitions because they have lived this life before, and occasionally you have this weird feeling. I've been here before. People turn around to me and say, deja vu, it's evidence of reincarnation. No, it's not. How can it possibly be? If I have a reincarnation now of standing in front of this audience, this is not me remembering somebody else's life. This is me remembering standing today in Edinburgh, wearing these clothes, talking to this audience. So any deja vu sensation I have now is because it's personal to me if that makes sense. So you are living your life again, and at the end of that second life, you again go into the zero point field, and you start your life again. And this happens time and time and time again. And the interesting thing is, I believe that you do it like Connors does in Groundhog Day, the movie. You live the day, stroke the life, over and over again, till you live the perfect life. You win the game. And then you're allowed to move on, to die, to do whatever you want. And remember, this all happens in the split second before you die. Millions of lives, done tons of lives. Because, of course, time is relative. And in my book, The Labyrinth of Time, I explain the science of how time is subjective. So all my books mix in with this, and each of my books gives you a different aspect of the overall theory and hypothesis. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a better picture of exactly where I'm coming with this. I'm sure you have dozens of questions, and I'm quite happy to, to spend time answering them, because I think the best times I ever do my talks is when I get feedback from the audience. 
because I need you to give me the feedback and everything else to see if it makes sense to you. Okay? Very much so. Autism is something that absolutely fascinates me um, for the same reason that uh, temporal lobe epilepsy fascinates me because there are members of my group that, who are autistic um, and it's intriguing because it seems that they are, their brain functions in a very, very different way. And just because we can't understand the way their brain functions probably frustrates them. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the book, The Strange strange tale of the dog in the afternoon and the way that bring, gives you the idea of how somebody in an autistic world works and I have um, some examples in my writing of individuals who are autistic that show profound precognitive abilities and I'll give one small example um, there's a friend of mine who lives in Liverpool whose son is profoundly autistic and has temporal lobe epilepsy and one day, he was at a mutual friend of ours who's, who's a psychologist. And Ed and his wife went into central Liverpool to go shopping while their son was with Tony, the, the psychologist. And they were about six or seven miles away. And they went into town. And when they were in a coffee shop, they were listening to the music on the PA system. And again, showing my great age, uh, the a music called I'll Pick a Rose for My Rose by Marv Johnson the old Tamla Motown record came on. And Ed and his wife said, I wonder what ever happened to Marv Johnson? And they had a discussion about it. They then get back in the car and they drive back to Tony's clinic. And as they get into the room, his son is sitting in the corner. And, Mo and Ed's son turns round as they walk in and he just looks at them and says, what ever happened to Marv Johnson? Ed was so stunned by this, he texted me straight away. Now that is inexplicable. Clearly, this young lad is a very, he can access information from the field, from somewhere. And that's just one of many examples. And I think we can learn a great deal from autistic people. Because the aut autism, Gershwin syndrome, a lot of these unusual syndromes are effectively giving us clues to alternate ways of the brain functioning. Rather than them being disabilities, which of course they are, and they're terrible disabilities, but these, these people have other advantages as well that we need to look into far more. So thank you for that. Yeah, the, one of the areas that my next book, The Infinite Minefield, will be discussing in detail is the, the history of um, drug, well, drugs is the wrong term, entheogens, um, substances that can actually open up the mind to alternate realities. And what I'll be doing is I take the reader along the Silk Road um, from uh, ancient Sumer, along the Silk Road, seeing how certain themes continue through. As you're probably aware, there's the mythical substance Soma in India, and you also have the Kaikion in the ancient, the ancient Greek world as well. And I'm intrigued with the links between these substances and the pineal gland, and how there seems to be a direct relationship between the pineal gland and these substances. And also the qualitative differences between, as you say, LSD, psilocybin, but particularly DMT, and specifically, specifically 5-MeO-DMT. Um, I recently interviewed, um, and it's up there on the web anyway, and if anybody's interested in listening to this, I interviewed a guy called Dr. Martin W. Ball, who is one of the world's leading experts on 5-MeO-DMT. And again, we were discussing the qualitative difference because it seems that in many cases, dimethyltryptamine and by implication ayahuasca sometimes can, can actually generate um, hallucinations, and of course that's such a pejorative term, you know, nobody knows what a hallucination is, we just think because we've labelled it, we understand it, of course we don't, we've just given it a name, um, where the hallucinations are shared. And I know of individuals myself who have told me that they have been in these states where they actually have shared experiences. 
Tom Campbell in his books actually talks about shared experience as well in My Big Toe. So in which case, if you can have shared experiences within these altered states of consciousness, what does that tell us about reality? The only reason that we believe this reality is this reality and it is real is because it's consistent and because it is consensual in the sense that we share it with other people. However, if you are then in a hallucinatory state and you share that hallucinatory state with somebody else, apparently that's then a folie a deux. And if there's a group of you, it's a group hallucination. But why do we define one thing one way and another thing the other? Is this not a group hallucination and exactly the same definition? And indeed, could it be that when people actually take DMT and experience DMT, they are just experiencing a different part of reality that is ordinarily denied to us? And I'm always fascinated, again, with the example of people who experience things such as autism are experiencing just another level of vibrationary reality in exactly the same way. And in fact, a friend of mine, when he took DMT for the first time, and again, I make very much links. I'm not, I'm not uh, probably a follower of Dennis McKenna and the idea of the machine elves. Uh, probably a, a, an odd reference if you don't know about McKenna. But effectively, there is an argument to say that there is a linkage here between this and the abduction phenomenon, and I believe there is to a certain extent. I was talking to Whitley Strieber about this recently when Whitley interviewed me on his radio station. I think there is a link between this and various other experiences. Because I'll just make the final point. This friend of mine, when he took DMT, he felt he crashed out of his chest shot off into space, found himself in a void with beings around him, which sounds very like a near-death experience. But the thing that was strange for him is he thought straight away, oh my God, I'm back there again. He recognized where he was. This was a place he knew. And while he was there, he could only believe that this was the hallucination, not the place he was. So thank you for the question on DMT. Totally. Hugh Everett III um, was a PhD student. If anybody doesn't know Hugh Everett III, I'll just give you some background. Hugh Everett III was a PhD student. And funnily enough, Hugh Everett III's son is the, the lead singer of a band called The Eels. If anybody knows The Eels at all, that's his son. Mark is, is Hugh Everett's son, OK? Oh, because he did the program, didn't he? He did. So Hugh Everett III, the, the major problem in particle physics at the time was something called the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And I, I, it would take ages to do the backstory of exactly why Schrodinger's cat is, is old. But the basic idea is whether the act of observation brings a subatomic particle into existence or not. And Erwin Schrodinger said, if you locked a cat in a box and sealed it for half an hour, and at some time inside that box there was a 50-50 chance that a subatomic particle would decay or not decay, which was then attached to a little file which would smash a glass which would put cyanide and kill the cat, the argument would be that the subatomic particle doesn't exist until somebody observes it. So therefore, the cat in the box is alive and dead at the same time. This is, this is the, the classical interpretation of particle physics as put forward by, by Niels Bohr and, and Born and various other individuals. Hugh Everett III came up with the revolutionary statement to say that the, 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 particle, the wave function of the particle doesn't collapse, when the box is opened, one scientist observes a dead cat and one scientist observes a live cat. He then took that to its logical to extreme to say that the universe continually is splitting into identical copies of itself and has been doing so since the first moments of the Big Bang. Recently, there was a survey done of some of the world's leading particle physicists and the majority of them, including Stephen Hawking, very much said that the only way that observed behaviors of subatomic particles can be accommodated is the many worlds interpretation of particle physics. So literally there are trillions of universes, there are trillions of versions of you, and each version of you will, will live a subtly different life. Now this is a theme that's plenty in, in, in movies, and I'm thinking about sliding doors for instance, there's various other movies based upon this. The latest concept of this is actually taking it one step further. And this is the work, again, of Stephen Hawking and a guy called Thomas Hertog, who is one of his associates at CERN. And they come up with something called the top-down interpretation of particle physics. And it's even more interesting. They are suggesting 
that, rather similar to my hypothesis, that every possible outcome of every decision is already encoded out there in something. They don't say what it is. I say it's the zero-point field. It's all encoded in there, and depending upon your choices is what reality decoheres from all the potentials. So you make a choice now. You made the choice to ask that question. Had you not asked that question, the reality we are now in would continue to be a statistical chance. Because you asked that question, for us, and the people in this room, that universe has decohered into one point universe, which is this one. And everything that comes from that decision then bounces out from there. But this explains, for instance, the many worlds interpretation explains one of the weirdest things possible, something called the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is this, it's quite simple. If this is the only universe there's ever been, this universe got it right first time for conscious life to evolve as we are. Now that might sound strange, but if you think about it, if there's only ever been one universe, it's only ever had one chance to get everything right. From the first moments of the Big Bang, the balance between dark energy and normal energy, the balance between helium and hydrogen within the universe, if all these things had only been a very tiny shade different, life would not have evolved. So life evolved. Now, it's either the universe got it right first time, in which case we have to suggest it was planned, or there have been trillions and trillions of universes, and there are trillions of universes, and we happen to live in one that got it right. So in which case that gets over the cosmic anthropic principle as well which, of course, a lot of people don't like because it suggests design. And, of course, you can't say to a, society, a scientist that things are designed because they don't like the idea of design in that way because it suggests a designer. But, effectively, that's two of the areas. And, again, if you want to read the book, The Cosmic Anthropic Principle, really read it. It's quite fascinating. It will blow your mind. In fact, um, a recent book was based upon it called The Goldilocks Enigma. Uh, and I can't think who wrote that, but it's well worth checking out because it gives you all these fine-tunings that took place in order to make you be here. And on a final point, I'd like to say, don't you find it strange, I do, that your whole life and all your ancestors, from the time of the amoeba crawling out onto land, all your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all the choices you've made in your life, up until this moment, was to get you here now, this second. And I always find that absolutely amazing to think, all the decisions, and I'm now here. Of course, there could be the argument, as Cumberland will counter say, that only one in 10 million people, one in 50 million people will win the lottery. But one person will win the lottery, and they'll think, my, well, God, wasn't it coincidence that I won the lottery? But of course, that's from the viewpoint after the event. And we do have to take that into account as well. OK. Well, well thank you very much. Um, it's been, been great talking. I'm sorry I rushed through things a little bit fast. And I'm sure that it probably left you more confused than anything. But systematically, read your way through my books. Look me up on YouTube. There's tons of material on there. Also, look me up on Facebook. I have a large community on Facebook. There's about 3,500 people on there. It's getting bigger every day. We also have groups that talk about my ideas worldwide. So join in. I don't have the answers. It's you guys that have the answers. I'm just trying to make sense of my life. Thank you.